Good day, Tim. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. Well, it's a delight to be here with you, uh, I Appreciate the invitation. Well, you're quite welcome. You and I met at ISPI probably a little over a decade ago, and, and from your LinkedIn profile, I see that you're currently the Director of Consulting Services for the ROI Institute where you provide consulting, research, and workforce development using the Institute's ROI methodology. Yes. I see that you also deliver training for the United Nations for program and project managers on how to evaluate their results-based management initiatives. And you serve on university faculties where you teach graduate-level courses applying evidence-based learning and performance improvement tools and methods. Yes. But let's go back a little bit to the beginning of your journey uh, in the profession. Uh, can you share with us uh, where you grew up and what your interests were early in life and tell us a little bit about uh, college and what you may have studied? Sure, happy to do that. Yeah, I, uh, I grew up in a small town about 25 miles southwest of Pittsburgh called Washington, PA. And um, I enlisted in the Air Force in 1971 after graduating uh, from high school and uh, for four years, I was a, a nuclear weapon specialist uh, stationed in different parts of the country. I can't tell you where I was stationed because I could neither confirm nor deny the presence of nuclear weapons. But uh, after I did my four years in the Air Force, I, uh, I separated and went back to Duluth, Minnesota, uh, where I had met my future wife at that time. And uh, we got married about 45 years ago, and uh, I went to college. I uh, got a degree in uh, become a medical laboratory technician, and after spending about a year working in a hospital drawing blood and dealing with stats, I decided that um, I didn't want to work in the healthcare system anymore doing that. So I went to college, uh, University of Minnesota in Duluth, and uh, I earned my uh, bachelor's degree in communication uh, in three years. I took an accelerated, went to summers and all that kind of stuff. And I also uh, was commissioned in the Air Force uh, through the Air Force ROTC program there. During the time, I discovered that I really missed the Air Force and um, decided to get my commission. So that's what I did. So after I was commissioned in 79, I went back in and I, I was a, a missile combat crew commander with the ICBMs, uh, the Internet, Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, with the Titan II in Tucson, Arizona, and the Minuteman II weapon system in um, Missouri. So I did combat crew time as a deputy commander and a uh, combat crew commander and uh, was a staff officer after that with the ICBM secure codes. And it's kind of interesting because during the time that um, I was on missile crew, I was being selected to be an instructor, be in the training department. And, you know, when I was in high school, you know, when people asked me what I wanted to do when I grew up, I didn't say, well, I'm going to be a trainer. Uh, that wasn't even in my you know, thoughts, but it was just one of those things they said that, hey, we like how you do business. We like how you work. We want you to show other people how you do it. So I thought, yeah, it's a great honor. So so, so that's what I did. Um, and it was, it was during that time when I was in the Titan II crew that they put me in the instructor shop and I got involved with some, some different things uh, dealing with something new back there in 1980 called ISD. Yeah, at least it was new to us. Uh, and... Uh, so that's kind of how I got into the training business a little bit. When I was stationed at um, Whiteman Air Force Base with the Minuteman II is where I got my master's degree in communication. And uh, after that, I went out to Vandenberg Air Force Base where I was the senior courseware developer for all of the curriculum for all of the Air Force's ICBM uh, academic and advanced simulator training programs. So I oversaw about 28 officers who created the curriculum that we use to train uh, the new missile launch officers in their initial qualification training to get them, uh, you know, mission ready to go back to the wings, and then they were made combat ready back there. My final assignment after that was uh, with the Air Force ROTC program in Orlando, Florida, where I was the uh, Commandant of Cadets, the uh, Executive Officer, the ed Education Officer, and I had an assignment Greece to go up to the Pentagon to be working on the base realignment and closure. Of folks up there and my my oldest daughter reminded me that um, I promised them when they hit high school that we wouldn't move again <laughs> and uh, you know they remembered I didn't but daddy made a promise so daddy keeps his promise so that's when I retired from the Air Force back in 1994 uh, after I retired I uh, became a private school principal 
a K-5 through 12 school principal. They had a school was on the verge of collapse, and they said they needed some strong leadership to come in and turn it around. I came in, did that uh, for a little bit. And uh, some other things that I did after that, I've been the, uh, the uh, director of uh, academic services uh, for a, a, a private college, uh, a four-year degree college. And I also worked at Lockheed Martin. I retired from Lockheed Martin a few years ago. And um, during that time, I was the manager of their uh, science of learning and performance improvement team. And what we did was we were the architects of training and performance uh, performance of solutions that were used for global initiatives with um, military, uh, governments, and, and different things like that. Um, you know, a couple of projects I worked, I worked with NASA, I worked with Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We, you know, we just did a lot of really cool, interesting things. And then I retired from them uh, and I spent about six months at home enjoying retirement. And then my wife says, get out of the house, go do something. So I started my own business up and I uh, was doing that for a while. And that's when I met Jack and Patty Phillips. And uh, we got to know them a little bit. I was an associate of theirs for a little while. Then they, in, then they uh, invited me to be a, a, a part of their team as a, a full-time employee. So that's what I've been doing for the last three years. So that, that's a little bit about what I've been doing uh, over there. Also, uh, just to mention, while I was at uh, Lockheed Martin is when I earned my, um, my Ph.D. Uh, in education with a specialization in training and performance improvement uh, with Capella University. So right now what I'm doing is I'm with ROI Institute. Uh, I'm teaching with the United Nations System Staff College, uh, like you mentioned, uh, teaching them the ROI methodology, how they can apply that for their uh, global initiatives. And um, I'm also, let's see, what else am I doing right now? And, and I'm on the faculty of Capella University. That's the other thing I'm doing. I'm working with master's and PhD students with their academics and dissertations and capstones and things like that. So other than that, um, I'm really not doing that much, and I'm hoping the third. I'm hoping the third time I retire, it's a charm. You know, I get it right this time. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, thank you for your service and uh, for sharing. That's a fascinating story here of uh, your journey. Um, can, can you share a little bit more about uh, your first exposure to human performance technology or evidence-based practices for performance improvement, or however you refer to that? <laughs> Yeah, I remember it well, because uh, it, it was back in 1980 when I mentioned to you that uh, I was selected for the instructor shop to to be able to, um, uh, you know, train other instructors out there how to, to, you know, do what I was doing. And they put me on a new crew, and it was called the ISD crew. And we didn't know anything about it. You know, I was we were in charge of training the entire Titan II wing and all the other instructors out there how to apply this new thing called ISD. So we, we didn't know, so we had to go out there and do some research. And we couple stumbled, stumbled across this thing called a Criterion Reference Instruction by, by Mager and, and, and Pipe. And, you know, we were going through the self-paced instruction and learning all kinds of different things. And one of the things they had in there was something called performance analysis. And that really intrigued me because one of the things they, they brought up in there was, was not every solution out there is involved training. And I'm going, well, that's interesting because one of the, the issues that we had on our crew out there was um, anytime a crew member made an error on something, their, their, their approach was is not only would they train the crew that made the error, but they would train everybody. You know, they took what we call the sheep dip approach. You know, the idea, the idea out there, if you have one sheep with, uh, you know, a flea, you got to dip all the she uh, sheep out there in case they have fleas. And that was the approach they took. And we were sitting back, well, it's not a training issue. They know. I mean, we had one. It was the senior instructor crew, and they misread the clock when to turn keys. They knew how to read a clock. They taught how to train the clock. But because they made an error, they had to be retrained on how to read a clock. And then they trained everybody in the wing on how to read a clock. And we're going, how dumb is that? So that's when I was looking at that performance analysis and saying that, you know, well, not every solution is a training. And a lot of people use training as a, you know, as something they say, well, we took action. We did something. And so if it happens again, well, we did everything we could. So it was from that point on that I started looking at, well, what other things do we need to consider Besides training, and, and that's what I kind of went back to some of my the training that I had in my education, as, you know, behavioral sciences with communication, and um, trying to understand. P 
people are complex things. And just because someone makes an error, they just may have made an error. It could, could be anything. So instead of taking a knee-jerk approach, you know, the sheep dip approach to solving all the problems, that's when I started looking at and doing my, my journey of trying to figure out, okay, what are some of the other possibilities out there that we can take a look at of how can we improve the performance of the crew members out there to ensure that we were mission ready and met mission requirements out there without everything being blamed uh, as a training deficiency. Well, thank you. Yes, uh, Baker and Pipe's uh, book, uh, Analyzing Performance Problems, or They Really Ought to Wanna, is, uh, is a classic. It was the very first book I was given when I graduated from college and got into the biz. Yeah. Um, who were some of your other uh, uh, influences in this uh, area, uh, people or articles or books um, besides uh, that and what you were exposed to in the Air Force? Well, I really started getting into it a little bit when I started plugging in with the uh, International Society for Performance Improvement and getting exposed to some different articles out there. You know, I, I knew about needs assessment and then was exposed to the writings of, of Roger Kaufman uh, and Joe Harless you know, what some of the things that they were putting together out there. I mean, I remember getting into a big discussion when I was at Lockheed, the difference between a front-end analysis and a needs assessment. We didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, you know, those are some of the early ones that we had because the big issue that we were looking at was the diagnostic side of the house. And then I was introduced to, uh, you know, Gilbert and Rummer. And those they just opened my eyes to so many things about perspectives that we should have when we're going in and taking a look at organizational issues and looking at the workforce to find out what's preventing people from doing their jobs the way that they should be doing it. I believe that everybody comes to work, they want to do a good job. And if you go back to Deming, you know, he talks about what 90 some percent of the issues in an organization is caused by management. So let's, let's figure out what the true root causes are so that we can come up with the real solutions. So I would say, again, you know, besides Mager and Pipe, but you're looking at Kaufman, you're looking at uh, Gilbert, you're looking at Rummler, you know, some of the giants that we have out there that, um, Harless, that really formed my shaping to thinking differently about when we go into a situation, even though we may have a training background, a lot of times people come to us for a training solution because they're looking for somebody to blame when it doesn't work. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Let's shift the, uh, gears here a little bit. Uh, as a way of providing a model or an example for others, if you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do, what would that be? Well, that's, that's a good question because where I'm at right now is I like to say that I help organizations see and show the value of what they do. And I also help them discover things that their managers don't know about their organization. So what we're looking at doing is stepping back and taking a look at a diagnosis, you know, kind of like a medical doctor out there. Someone comes in and says, you know, doctor, I'm having some chest pains out there. You know, I think I need open heart surgery. We just don't go in and give them open heart surgery. We try to do some diagnosis to figure out what the root causes are out there, what's causing the chest pain. And eventually we say, you know, hey, I suggest you lay off the pepperoni pizzas in the evenings. But what I do is I come in, help diagnose what the root causes are to pre that prevents an organization from achieving organizational objectives, make sure that we align the solution to address those problems to meet program objectives, and then we evaluate at the end to see what went well, what we could do better, and how can we make the program even better after that. And it's all about, you know, do we want to spend 5% of our budget to find out how well we did with the other 95% or not? Or do you, we want to take a faith-based initiative out there and just have faith that it works? Excellent. Thank you. Can you share with us, uh, your, as a lifelong learner, your current focus or next focus for your own personal learning or professional learning? Yes. Uh, yeah, that, that's interesting because I learned an important lesson when I was writing my, my master's degree thesis on listening. And uh, in the field... Everybody was quoting this well-used phrase out there about the world of communication. And I did, on a whim, I decided I was going to go back to the original source on that, like it quoted properly. And when I went back to the original source, I found out that everybody out there was misquoting it. They had it wrong. They were just repeating each other's. All these researchers were just repeating each other's research without going back and rechecking the original source. 
So one of the things that I've been trying to do is go back and take a look at the original sources, the founders of our profession. You know, going back again, looking looking at Kaufman, you know, looking at Harless, you know, looking at Gilbert. And one of the things that I've been doing is when I've been reading Thomas Gilbert's book on human competence, is I discovered that you know whenever we say Gilbert, typically people automatically come up with well the behavior engineering model. It's what they automatically think about, but that's that's only a small part of what Gilbert was talking about. And if you take a look at the subtitle of his book, it's called Engineering Worthy Performance. Well, what's this worthy performance thing that he's talking about? What are we trying to get to? So I, I did some research on that and tried to investigate a little bit further to try to understand what he was doing. And to do that, I'm a believer that you really don't know what you're talking about if you can't put it in writing. So what I did was I started writing it out what I was doing in the form of an article, and I ended up writing three articles about it. And the first two have just been published in the Performance Improvement Journal, and they're called The State of Engineering Worthy Performance and the Ten Standards. So in the first one, what I looked at was, um, you know, looked at the charter that Gilbert established for our profession, and, and if we strayed from it, by creating some kind of an eclectic jungle that kind of confuses practitioners out there. You know, we're, we're trying to be all things to all people. And the, the second article, what I did was I tried to look at an advanced logic model to return us to the, what Gilbert called the three-edge ruler principles that he advocated that we have to do to try to prevent us from getting into that eclectic jungle. And then the third article, which is being published now, I, I, I provide a case study um, that shows how we can use this advanced model and, and apply the ADDIE model and apply our 10 standards performance improvement and the HPT model and, and all these different things out there so that we can, um, we can run through the jungle and engineer worthy performance. So, you know, that's out there and we'll see how the field reacts to it. And I'm sure some people out there would be very happy to provide me with some very helpful and constructive feedback. <laughs> Of course, that's the course. that's the way uh, ISPI has been since the days of NSPI and before that. Um, that's shifting uh, slightly, although you may have just covered some of these here. My my next question is: Is there a favorite, or maybe it's not a favorite, but a, a phrase or a term that comes from the world of performance improvement that you would like to define for us? And when I ask this question, it's because some people are unhappy uh, in how some uh, language, uh, terms, uh, phrases are being used. So yeah. do you have something that you, you can clarify or share with us your take on that? Yes. Yeah, happy to. And I see this a lot in, in articles that I read in papers from graduate students and they're writing even dissertations in capstones is, is we throw around the term performance and a lot of people really don't know what it means and they assume that other people have the same shared meaning when we talk about performance. And I remember I was on a phone call one time with some, some folks, and they said that, well, you know, we are, you know, in the, the performance improvement industry out there, is we're the experts on performance improvement. And I'm going, now, hold on a second. I said, you're trying to tell me that every other organization out there is saying, finally, someone's come along that's interested in improving performance. They all do the same thing. Everybody's out there trying to improve performance in organizations and improve, you know, human performance. So what really makes us unique when we're talking about improving performance? And, you know, we talk about accomplishments, but what is it that we're looking at? We're not talking about behavior, which Gilbert says we leave behind, but, you know, performance, those accomplishments are things that we leave behind. And those are things that manage, that matter to managers, those key performance indicators out there. So what we're delivering out there is not only desired performance that people want, those accomplishments, but again, back to Gilbert, we are also ensuring that we're providing worthy performance. And by worthy performance, we're talking about is the benefit, the desired performance that we've delivered, is it worth the cost of getting there? So we got to have that balance. You know, we don't want to be like a situation out there at a, a, a utility company where they put in a program and over two years they saved $1.5 million. Hey, that's wonderful. The people rejoiced. But then they later on figured out that it cost them $2 million to save 1.5. So if you don't have that denominator in the, in the, the calculation, the worthy performance calculation that uh, Gilbert advocated, which we also call the ROI calculation, you don't know if the investment that you made, the improvements that you made were worthwhile or not, or you just made matters worse. 
So that's where I'm coming from. When I talk to people, I say, you know, what we're about is worthy performance. And that usually gets their attention. They go, well, what do you mean by worthy performance? Well, not only do we improve organizational performance by improving the performance of the workforce, but we also make sure that it's a good investment, that the benefit that we receive from it outweighs the cost of getting there. Otherwise, why are we doing it? We're better off before. So that's kind of where my little bugaboo is right now. <laughs> well, thank you. I, uh, I share that with you as well. And, and many others do. Uh, let's shift a little bit now to uh, talk about uh, some people that uh, you've interacted with and have influenced you that you'd like to do a shout out on. Tell us perhaps a couple of stories. We talked about this before we hit the record button. So you were going to uh, share something about uh, an interaction or two with uh, Roger Kaufman and then Judy Hale. Yeah. You know, the thing is, is, you know, when you have people out there in our, in our profession who've written books and, you know, they're giants in our field out there, you kind of think very highly of them. Uh, you go, they're, they're untouchable. I remember the first time I met um, Roger Kaufman when he came down and he spoke at our ISPI chapter, and I was just having a conversation with him really nice and I mentioned to him that, you know, that I was retired Air Force. And he stopped and he looked at me and he says, thank you for your service. And this was before it was popular to say that. And I, I was just struck by that, uh, that, you know, first of all, he thanked me for that. But, but the fact that he just seemed, he just like, wow, I was just so impressed by that. And then going out and having dinner with him afterwards and his wife, Jan, and getting to know him a little bit, get to know their family. They were so approachable, and that's the thing I really love about, you know, the society, the performance improvement society that we belong to, is the individuals out there are so approachable and helpful to what you want to do. Uh, they are freely share uh, the wisdom and insights they've had over the years in investing in the future. And now I'm no young chick, but they still invested in me as well. And then with Judy, the same thing. I remember Judy, you know, she was at the second time around society chapter, uh, society president. And just sitting down and having a cup of coffee with her, and she was just so free and giving and caring and giving me things, and and I've become friends with these individuals out there. Something I never in my life would have dreamed that a kid who grew up in a trailer court in Wolfdale, Pennsylvania, would end up being friends with people like this who've made such contributions uh, to our to our profession and and are recognized around the globe as thought leaders. It, it just amazes me. So, what I when I think about, you know, people that influence me, the, the just just how approachable these professionals are out there and willing to share, and I, I just think that's a wonderful thing. Yes, it, uh, that's been my experience since I joined the organization back in '79. Is that people were approachable and they were willing to share, and I've seen that uh, in all the interactions over the decades here. Absolutely. And you've been the same way, Guy. I really appreciate everything you shared. Well, thank you. Uh, as a kind of a wrap to our interview here, uh, my final question is for the new people that are entering the field, uh, whether they're young or middle-aged or older, what words of wisdom or guidance do you have for them? <laughs> okay, this is the deep thought section, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would have to say that I learned long ago that success is about relationships, and so is performance improvement. And when I go back and I take a look at you know my behavioral science background, you know, with my research in communication and listening, and you know, dealing with organizational behavior, and, and then my experiences over the years, I remember I got in a conversation with someone out there who was really upset about what she called the good old boy system. And she said that, you know, well, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I remember talking to her, I said, you know, it's, it's been my experience that that expression is not true. It's not about who you know, it's about who knows you. Have you developed a relationship with them that they're saying that this is somebody that I know that I could trust. This is somebody that I can go to. And I said, the way that you develop those relationships and you develop that success path out there it's not by getting to know other people, it's by them getting to know you. So since I became involved with the performance improvement community, and particularly through you know, the International Society for Performance Improvement, I've discovered that meeting these individuals out there has given me opportunities that I never knew would be possible, and they have introduced me to other people out there that I never would have met. 
So my my suggestion to those out there who are new to our profession is to get outside your comfort zone. Just don't sit in your office and do a job. You're in a profession. You know, a rubber band is no good unless it's stretched. And you want to stretch yourself out there. You want to get involved with, you know, a professional organization like the International Society of Performance Improvement. Go to the conferences. Go to chapter meetings. Get involved. Do things out there. And it's through that involvement that I was able to to meet so many people out there. And, again, you know, I would end up doing this this video. I never thought I'd be doing a video like this. You know, I was told years and years ago that I had the perfect face for radio. <laughs> so for me to do this is quite an accomplishment, I think. Tim Brock, thank you so much for agreeing to do this with us today. And thank you for sharing your insights and wisdom. Have a My great pleasure. day. Thank you, too.